Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden, and today we're going to talk about the unsung heroes of the comic book industry. Inkers, letterers, and artists. So this is a video I've wanted to make for actually years now. It's been sitting on my to-do list for a long time, and it's something I've wanted to talk about for ages and ages. The reason being is that I don't feel as though a lot of readers out there and just casual fans of comic books know the difference between these types of roles in making a comic book and why these people are important in making a comic book good. It's very easy to point to a writer or an artist and understand what they did to make this comic a reality, as it is to look at a colorist. Those roles are pretty self-evident in and of themselves. A writer prepares the script of the comic in varying degrees of uh, detail. I've always been a bit of a preference for the non-Marvel style, where a writer really walks the artist through what they envision for their comic and what they kind of expect out of it in terms of a layout. The shorter Marvel style, which is basically just consisted of one or two page summaries, was largely made to benefit people like Stan Lee, while putting a lot of the onus of the creativity on the artist. When you have a good artist, they can take the lead and really add a lot of their own creative input into a story, and that's kind of how Steve Ditko ended up being a major influence on a character like Spider-Man, and why he is, in a lot of ways, the co-creator of Spider-Man, if not the outright creator, as the man would go on to claim later in his life. From there, an artist takes a script and sort of pencils in a rough outline of what the comic will look like. The penciling is often how these artists are credited, and usually they're viewed as the primary co-creator of a given comic book series. From there, the artist will either fill in the inks themselves or pass it off to an inker. Now, in the old days, pretty much every series would have its own inker, therefore allowing the artist to mainly focus on the pencils of each individual issue, while the inker would go in adding some details and giving each image a little bit more depth and well-defined detail to it. In more recent years, artists have taken on both roles of penciler and inker, often doing so because, well, the pay's better. It's one less person to pay in terms of getting these comics put together, it's one less person to worry about having a fair share of the production as a whole in terms of the money that each individual issue makes. That's why you don't always see an inker being specifically credited in a comic book issue. In stories like that, where there's one person being credited as the artist of the series, that artist usually is doing both the penciling and inking of their own work. It's a bit of a pride issue with artists too, as they want to make sure that it's their own stamp and their own work that is being recognized in each issue, rather than having to pass it off to one more person to worry about. Again, this kind of depends on what's best for each individual issue. I'm not saying that every good comic needs a good inker, but I am saying that any time I see an issue that looks rushed, it often doesn't have a specific person working on the ink. Having that extra person in the lineup usually makes for a little bit of extra quality control. He can firm up some details and work on panels that didn't quite work on the initial penciling. They're often an important part of making a comic look and feel good. And I'm not saying anything in absolutes here. Some great comics don't involve an inker, others do. Some terrible comics do have an inker, others do not. I am just saying in general it seems more likely that comics and issues published with an inker tend to benefit from the quality quite significantly. From there it goes to the colorist, and you can guess what happens there. They add color and give the life to the comic that is often present in color-based comics. With the exception of certain titles such as The Walking Dead or maybe Robots vs. Zombies, color is usually a very important element of any good comic and add a lot in terms of giving it a feeling of life and energy that simply wouldn't be there with simple black and white. Again, we're not speaking in absolutes here. There's some excellent black and white comics, and that can often lead to a solid tone to the overall issue if done correctly. But usually, a good colorist makes all the difference in the world and can really bring a scene to life in a big way. Just look at the difference between images without color and those with. It is like night and day a lot of times, especially in establishing slots or scenes with a lot of space that the color can fill in in important ways. That's where colorists tend to shine the most, is in big shots of empty rooms or large shots of horizons that they really get to show their stuff in. Then we have the letterers, and those are one of the most overlooked people in all of the comic book industry. 
Marvel even seems to outsource them, as well as a few other publishers, to VC, while DC does a little more of them in-house, and it kind of shows. DC in particular is what I think of when I think of good lettering. It's something I like in relatively newer comics as well, such as when Superman was talking to new Superman in Mandarin. That dialogue was colored in blue, but otherwise kept in English, making it an easy way to understand things while visually distinguishing the dialogue in Mandarin from the dialogue in English in a very creative way. There's all sorts of fun things you can do with lettering, as long as you don't screw it up. If you make the letters too weird or out there, then they're going to be hard to read, and that's going to have a negative impact on the overall quality of the comic. But that's pretty rare. More often than not, letterers do a really good job at giving each comic their own feel and uh, visual design of the font behind each lettering in a special way. The classic comic book block text with occasional bolding works well to occasionally emphasize certain lines and give a real feeling to the dialogue. Remember that when you're reading a comic, half the time you're reading the dialogue balloons in addition to the visual action, with the rare exception of those comics that have been published over the years without any dialogue whatsoever. Therefore, letters are a fundamental part of any good comic, and you, they deserve a lot of recognition for the hard work they put into giving a comic a sense of dialogue and life. Without them, a comic is pretty much little more than a collection of very nice, visually stunning pictures, and that's good in and of itself. Like I said, there's some excellent silent comics out there, but more often than not, they can deliver good dialogue in a strong way. Yes, they're not the ones coming up with the words, but they are the ones displaying them. And in that regard, they are every bit as important as, say, a penciler for bringing this comic into a visual medium. And then finally, throughout this entire process, editors overlook the entire thing. With larger managers working to oversee things in pretty much any comic publishing firm, each series also tends to have their own editor who looks over a certain batch of series. Marvel and DC are famous for this, having little wings of their own publication line based around certain elements of their canon. For example, there's a Batman publishing group along with a Superman publishing group, as is an X-Men one and a Spider-Man one over at Marvel. Editors might have it roughest of all out of all the people we're talking about today. I've talked about this before. A good editor tends to go unnoticed, offering little tidbits of advice for the writer and artist as they go along, making sure the comic is polished and professional as possible, and giving little tidbits of advice for the writer to add little details or remove something that doesn't work and just tweak things ever so slightly to make it the best possible comic it can be. Therefore, a good editor is one you don't notice and one that just helps a comic be made that you enjoy and love. The best comics out there likely owe a lot to the fact that they have a solid editor behind them. Not only that, but they're the ones who make the final decisions in terms of who gets what job and who does what with who which is often a fundamental element of whether or not a series will work. Certain writers and artists work well with each other, while others just simply aren't a good match. A big, serious writer who with lofty ideas and interesting stuff isn't going to fare well with Scotty Young, for example, who has very cartoonish stylings to him. On the other hand, a relatively goofy and laid-back writer is going to suffer a lot from the likes of someone with a strong element of realism or surrealism to their work, because it's not a match to the tone that the comedic writer is going to be trying to achieve with their comic. Putting stuff together like that is a real challenge. Often, it's an experiment. I've seen all the time creative teams launch a series that I think will be awesome that ultimately either don't work or need time to work. The Scott Snyder Greg Capullo team is a great example of that. They weren't perfect together at first. They took a while to get a handle on each other and how to write and draw for one another's writing and art, respectively. But now that it's working and they're used to each other, they're one of the best creative teams in the current world of comics. That whole dynamic and managing the various needs of different creative teams is what editors do best, and they're a fundamental aspect of any good comic. On the other hand, like a bad letterer, a bad editor is one of the most noticeable and atrocious things to happen in the history of comics. Bad editors put a kibosh on stories that are Theoretically controversial, but really just an example of being behind the times, such as when the editors put a kibosh on Batwoman getting married during the New 52, or mismanaging talent so that they walk away, the way Marvel did with Jim Starlin, who left the company embittered, and thus Marvel lost access to the man who created Thanos only a year or two ago. It's stuff like that that really 
creates a negative undercurrent within the big two companies, but can happen pretty much at any company. I don't know if any long-running comic book publisher out there hasn't suffered from a bad or lousy editor at one point or another, but I can't really think of any exceptions that didn't have some negative force in their company at some point or another in their long-standing history. From Archie to IDW, these editors wax and wane, and when a good editor takes over there, you can notice the difference. That's why Archie Comics started getting really interesting and weird in the last several years. There's a new guy in charge, the son of the original creator from what I understand, and he's done a lot of changes over the years to really challenge what I think of when I think of an Archie comic, and has therefore created quite a few series I quite enjoy from that publisher, such as Afterlife with Archie, that Archie series written by Mark Waid, I don't know if it's still going, and other little things such as uh, Archie vs. Predator, which I thought was really fun and interesting. And, just uh, exactly what it needed to be. So that's a rough breakdown on the people that make a comic book and some of the lesser known roles out there and why they're important for being part of a publication and why it makes a comic good. As of late, I've been trying more and more to include colorists, letterers, inkers, and editors in my reviews of comics, the least of which I've had any success with being the editors, who I often forget to mention or just neglect to mention because I can't possibly detect what they did and didn't do. They're just going to end up being the unsung heroes, but it's important to pay attention to what's published under a certain editor's time and realize that it reflects the quality of their work as an editor. But the other problem is I often find in a video it's very clunky to be rattling off the names of four or five people involved in a creative team. It's often a lot easier to display the team, such as this, in the nice little captions that pretty much every comma creates on one of their pages. That really helps in being able to convey that information without me stumbling over the pronunciation of every single name. Because I'm atrocious at pronouncing names, as long-term viewers of this channel will no doubt be well aware of at this point. And that's not really a culture issue on my part, because I'm just as bad at pronouncing European-based names as I am names from pretty much any other place in the world. It's just not something that I'm good at, gang, and you're all just gonna have to get used to it. Every instinct in me tells me this name is pronounced as Kevin Fiji. I don't know why, but that's just what's in my brain. Fiji, or whatever it really is, just isn't gonna come naturally to me ever. So that's just who I am, and it's important to recognize your own limitations. But doing videos like this and taking special time to recognize exceptional works of letterers or anchors or whoever along the way is important. It should also be noted that just because I don't mention them by name doesn't mean that I don't recognize their work here. It's why I often try and use phrases like the creative team behind this comic, because that represents the fact that it's usually several people involved in making a comic come to life. But I am not perfect in this regard, and sometimes it's easy just to call something Tom King series, even if yes, obviously, it's not just Tom King making the comic. It's called conversational language, and sometimes if it's easier, it's easier. If I neglect to mention a colorist, even if they do an exceptional job, well, it's not the end of the world. Yes, I understand that I am a comic book reviewer, and as such, I should be reviewing all parts of the mill. But that's very boring when it's just, it looks nice every single time is the only thing I can say, especially when we're in an ongoing series. If you look at how I review comics like that, comics that I review several issues and I look at a series on an ongoing basis, i.e. most of them, I tend to focus on different stuff for each review. That way it doesn't get stale and repetitive, but it doesn't leave a lot of room to mention every single person on every single creative team every single time. I say all of that because I often hear that being a criticism of reviewers in general from creative people within the comic book community. And I'm not trying to be dismissive of those concerns. There's a lot of reviewers out there who don't mention any of this and don't try and make any amends with the other aspects of the creative team. And I don't want to be just that. On the other hand, I think it is worth understanding that sometimes you just don't have time to mention everything in a review without that review becoming bloated and overly long. So sometimes it's easier just to keep it simple and let people find out who's on the creative team themselves. Likewise, if someone encounters a colorist and sees that they've worked on a bunch of series they love and recognize, well then that's as good a credit as any, and obviously that will convey to people what's good about you as an artist. So it's not that big a deal, or at least it's not as big a deal as I think people let it on to be. 
so long as these artists are allowed to use their works in building up their own CVs and resumes over time, then I don't fully see the harm in a reviewer occasionally forgetting to mention a letterer here and there. On the other hand, a review that neglects to mention the art at all is a pretty lousy review to begin with. I'm sure I'm guilty of this at some point or another, having done hundreds of these by now, but I'd like to point out that I always try and mention the art or talk about how I felt about it at some point in the review, and other times, you know, I go into more detail about the art than others. If I have something to say about contours, about how the eye movements when reading a comic are set up or ignored in certain uh, series, then I'll talk about it. If it's all good, then I can just say the art looks amazing. I don't really have to get into the detail of it every single time because believe me, it's going to get stale because it's just going to be the same things over and over again. I can talk about how the way lighting is set up in a panel looks really interesting or the way coloring is done can really add something to a panel, but I can only say the same thing so many times. That's the challenge of a good reviewer, keeping things different for each video, and I try and make each video we make have its own little feature or something different or something I haven't talked about before. Of course, that does mean that it's going to be difficult to mention every single person every single time. And I make this defense just to sort of give a little bit of leeway to my fellow reviewers out there. Often I see a lot of reviews that neglect to mention one of these aspects, and I don't fault them for it. But I do see people on Twitter, such as artists or colorists, who occasionally voice that complaint. Sometimes I think their concerns are valid, other times I think they need to understand the reality and needs of a good reviewer. And that is sometimes going to be to leave someone shirked in terms of credit. That is especially true for editors, like I said, because it's so hard to detect their good work. And we're left just sort of to figure it out as we go along, to see who's a valuable asset to the editing team and see who isn't. Sometimes when an editor or editor-in-chief leaves a company, there's a marked change in the tone and quality of the comics, and I think that speaks for itself. Other times, that's a lot more murky. Look at Joe Quesada, for example, a widely criticized editor at the time, who I've voiced plenty of concerns about before, that in more recent years I've gained a lot more sympathy towards, as it's become apparent that Joe Quesada just sort of made the best of a bad situation, and a lot of the worst decisions he made weren't his decisions to make. He's just the one who sort of had to carry the company line, had to carry out the directives given to him by people like Ike Perlmutter, and work with what he had, and in that regard he actually did a pretty good job. In fact, I'd go so far as to say he was a pretty good editor on the whole. He provided a lot of strong support for the creative teams going on at Marvel, but he had a lot of horrible directives handed to him, and it made him look pretty bad when he stood by those directives like a professional editor is supposed to. So that's all we're going to talk about today, but thanks for watching. Hopefully some of you got to learn a little bit of something about the comic book industry in general. And for those of you who didn't, well, at least it's something good to think about every once in a while, because we can all use that reminder to credit everyone in a comic book team and understand that it's not just one or two people working on any series. I think the fewest I've ever seen in any given publication is four or five people involved in the overall publication of this thing. And it's important that we recognize that. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section below, and if you like Comic Island, be sure to check out our Patreon page in the video description. And finally, don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.